I had to, I had to keep this thing kind of fluid until we could track down Andre. He, we've got him. Andre, welcome. We're glad to have you here. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. My name is John Hamry, uh, and I'm the president here at CSIS. Uh, delighted to have you here. Uh, when we do public events, people that are not normally at CSIS, we always start with a little safety announcement. I'm responsible for everybody's safety today, and I'm going to take care of you. If we do have a little emergency, as you, we're not going to go out the, the double doors we came in, but to the left there's an exit. We're going to go right out to the street. We'll take two lefts and a right. It'll take us over to the courtyard for National Geographic. I'm going to do a head count, and I'll get ice cream, and we'll celebrate a pleasant afternoon, hopefully. So if, if we have to do anything, nothing's going to happen. But if we have to, please follow my instructions so I can take care of everybody. <laughs> yeah, well, that, maybe that's what we, I think they've got vodka over there. Maybe that'd be a better place to rendezvous. We'll do that. Um, welcome to everybody. We're, uh, we're delighted to have you here. This is a, uh, well, it's, it's kind of a culmination, but not a stop. It's a culmination of a conversation that began in uh, October of 2015. When, uh, when Minister Ivanov and my dear friend Andre were in town and we had breakfast. And at the time we were saying, uh, you know, we got to do something. The, the, the trajectory of Russia-American relations is not good. And we need to do something. We're not going to, uh, we can't imagine a world in the future that will be better if our relations become more tense, more difficult, more hostile. And so let's do something, let's try to do it together. And I was very grateful that uh, Minister Ivanov uh, and, uh, and Andre were willing to you know, work on us that together. And our very good friends up at the Carnegie Corporation said they'd be willing to help us do this to try to have a sustained conversation about issues that were important to both of us. Well, we, back in October of 2015, we thought things are pretty bad, it can't get worse. Well, it's getting worse. You know, the relations between our two countries is becoming strained in ways I don't really remember from the heights of the Cold War as a young man. Uh, there is now a, uh, we're now projecting images of each other on the wall, and we are reacting to those images. We're not really listening to each other. So the purpose of this exercise uh, was to spend time identifying issues that we both have deep concerns about. It doesn't mean we agree on what's the best approach, but we both know that these are important issues and that we want to devote some time listening to each other how the other side thinks about it. I think that's an important contribution right about now when we've got you know, an awful lot of people talking and not enough people listening. My, my dear departed mother, she said, you know, God gave you two ears, one mouth, you ought to listen twice as much as you talk. And, you know, that's not bad advice for nations. We ought to be doing a little bit more listening to each other right now. I will say we're going to have big, sharp differences. That's understandable. We, we've had very different historical trajectories. Uh, our social systems are different. Uh, we have uh, a different alignment of people that we routinely interact with. Those, that's the natural course of history. That is not a reason for us not to be interacting with each other and talking with each other. And so what this, this effort was designed to try to start a pattern. And I hope we can continue it. I hope that you're willing to continue this because uh, I know that we need it in Washington. I'm, I, I'm going to get some nasty little emails by the time I get back up to my office here. But uh, we need to continue this dialogue. Uh, in, and in some areas, we're going to find progress. We're going to find things we can work on together because these are serious, deep problems. <clears throat> and in other areas, we're not. But we're going to have a better understanding of what the other party is thinking and trying to do. And uh, I think that becomes a contribution. And all of you, frankly, are going to play a role in that as you participate with us today, uh, listening to the report that comes out. You know, I would say that there are break, this isn't headline news opportunities, but these are important opportunities that we discuss here. And I hope that you'll listen carefully and pose your very thoughtful questions to these uh, individuals as we think about these together. Um, so thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being interested in this. And I want to say thank you to our colleagues. Uh, Igor, very, 
it's marvelous to have you in town. Oleg, welcome back. You know, he was here for nine years. I said if he'd stay one more year, he'd be a native in Washington, you know, but we, uh, we'll, we'll see if we can fix that a little bit. Uh, and Andre, thank you for pulling this together. And everybody, of course, knows Sergey, and, and uh, he, he camps out in my office whenever he comes to Washington, so that's really good. Let me, let me just say everyone knows Igor Ivanov, uh, foreign minister, deep, 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 foreign policy expertise for Russia, active interaction and engagement with, uh, with the United States and, and, of course, Spain, ambassador to Spain, had a, a remarkably deep uh, expertise. And we're, we're going to hear from him first. And then Oleg Stepanov, who was the DCM here and is now head of policy planning uh, for the foreign ministry, is going to follow him. So would you please now, with your applause, welcome Foreign Minister Igor Ivanov. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you uh, very much, dear friends and colleagues. First of all, I would uh, like to say that I am very pleased to be a part of this discussion today. The joint project with CSIS and the Russian International Affairs Council is a clear demonstration that even under the most difficult political circumstances, scholars and experts can find a way to work with each other, generating new ideas and proposals for cooperation. Unfortunately, there are not many projects like that between Russia and the United States today. And scholarly research on both sides is often mixed with journalism and uh, propaganda. It's particularly deplorable because to, nobody would claim that US relations are in the right track and uh, that a scholarly dialogue is not important. The current crisis in uh, uh, relations between uh, Washington and Moscow appears even more frustrating when one starts thinking about the mul multitude of very serious and very urgent problems that the United States and Russia have to confront today, confront today from international terrorism and climate change to global migration, management, and United Nations reforms. Instead of focusing on the emerging challenges of the 21st century, we tend to bring to life almost forgotten ghosts of the Cold War. I'm talking about ghosts of the Cold War because I don't believe that we can see the old system restored in fresh and blood. During the real Cold War, and some of us lived that period, our two countries were divided by irreconcilable ideological contradictions, something that does not exist now. Today, the world is very different from what it was during the Cold War. We have entered a very complex and controversial transformation process that should result in the establishment of a new global order. Nobody can say for sure what this new world order will look like. But at the same time, nobody can free the founding members of the United Nations and above all the permanent members of its Security Council from the responsibility they accepted to bear 70 years ago. It would be extremely dangerous and highly irresponsible to start dismantling the old system until a new one is put in place until it's tested and demonstrates its efficiency. Russia and the United States have a special responsibility to confront and contain the present global destabilization, as well as to build a new system of uh, international relations. Four principal reasons come to mind. First, the relationship between Moscow and Washington formed the axis of uh, world politics in the second half of the last century. Although the Cold War is in the past, it caused numerous problems that continue to poison international politics to this day, generating distrust, crises, and conflicts. Russia and the United States share the primary historical responsibility to overcome the Cold War legacy as soon as possible. Second, Russia and the United States remain the only countries in the world capable to destroy each other and the rest of the humanity many times over in a 
nuclear war. Therefore, issues such as nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation, and the prevention of nuclear terrorism fall primary on the sh shoulders of our two countries. Today and uh, yesterday, we had the meeting of board of director, directors of NTI, Nuclear Threat Initiative, and we discussed uh, with details how important is uh, cooperation in this field. And I think that uh, some people uh, uh, don't mention that even during the political tension which we have now, we, together we reached uh, the uh, um, agreement on nuclear issue of Iran, on nuclear problem of Iran. It means that if we understand the importance for our own security of the solution, it has to be done and not uh, postponed because of political interest of uh, somebody. That's why it's very important to understand that we cannot postpone solution. Postponing, you cannot resolve them, only complicating them. And this is nuclear problem of North Korea or many other issues, real threat or radiological threat and many other threats, cyber, which we have. Third, for many historical, uh, geographical, and economic reasons, Moscow and Washington almost inevitably become involved in the most pressing regional issues of the day. Fourth, our two countries are caught up in many of today's global problems. For example, the United States and Russia are more in the position to do more than other states to confront growing cyber threats and promote effective international cooperation in space exploration. One can argue that cooperation, even in areas that are not politically sensitive, is hardly possible if there is no trust between the parties. Indeed, mutual trust is critical to any successful cooperation. This begs the question of uh, how trust can be restored if the sides don't interact even with each other, even don't speak Trust is generated only through working together and through testing each other's commitments, consistency, and integrity. I have experience with many people here in Washington, with Colin Powell, with Madeleine Albright, with others working, and only working together every day on very difficult issues, we created trust, which still, will, till today we have trust among us. In my view, there are at, at least three crucial dimensions of the relationship that have to be preserved and developed further. First of all, the U.S.-Russian nuclear dialogue has to be resumed. If there is no dialogue between Washington and Moscow on strategic weapons, that sends a very hard signal to other nuclear countries, potential proliferators, and everybody else. For example, we were discussing with our colleagues how to restart uh, negotiations on nuclear issues. And my colleagues from China, from uh, France, from uh, Great Britain say, no, no, we have to, we can, we have to wait. Our uh, number of uh, nuclear warheads is, is uh, smaller. That's why you have to start Russia and Americans. And after that, let us see how things will go. It means everybody looking to Russia and to the United States because we are nuclear superpowers. 90% of uh, nuclear weapons uh, are in our hands. Mm, uh, our inability to talk to each other means that the new world order is likely to be based on a continuous arms race expanding membership in the club of nuclear states and the return to the old notions of deterrence, mutually assured destruction. Second, the United States and Russia have common interests in many regional crises and zones of instability, Syria, Palestine, Iraq, Afghanistan, Korean Peninsula, to name a few. No doubt the failure to agree on Ukraine will have and is already having a major negative impact on our ability to work together on other regional matters. But this should not be an excuse not to try. I will tell you, without uh, giving names, that I was speaking with uh, American negotiators 
with Iran, and they recognize that cooperation between Russia and the United States, Russian and uh, American experts, were vital to reach the agreement. Other countries also played their role, but the cooperation between our two countries were vital. And we have to recognize this. Sometimes we speak about, uh, we give only bad news, but we don't speak about what positive, positive pages in our modern history. Third, our two countries should under no circumstances sacrifice their cooperation in fighting international terrorism and extremism. After September 11th, we created working groups and we're working quite well on this. It's very delicate. We understand perfectly well area, but we worked. It's, this is not we invent something new. We worked and you may ask your people but uh, you can believe me that it was quite good cooperation and with good results. There is simply no alternative to such cooperation. The cooperation in this area is not a, a concession granted by the United States to Russia or vice versa. It's a long-term challenge to both of our societies as it is uh, to the rest of the world. Of course, there are many other important dimensions of U.S.-Russian relations that we would like to be preserved. My colleagues will speak. I have uh, five, seven minutes only. That's why I will try to, to conclude here. But I, will, I want to say we are ready to continue this work. This is our first uh, exercise. But I think that it's positive. We demonstrated with very quite difficult topics we selected that co topics that we can speak, we can find common language, we have differences, but at the same time, we can elaborate together suggestions and proposals which may be useful for our uh, government, for our leadership. We are working for the future. If it's not today, it will come tomorrow. I'm sure that uh, this period, one day or the other, will finish, and we will start again as partners working on very difficult issues, which we have to do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, yes, Alex Stepanov, the Director of the Policy Planning Department at the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much. <laughs> dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, I have an opportunity to read the report and the preview of the report, and uh, I believe that experts from uh, both U.S. and uh, Russia achieved remarkable results. Uh, this report is a product of very comprehensive and thoughtful research on critical areas of our bilateral cooperation and proposed practical measures to repair the broken state of things. Today, when relationship between our two countries is frankly not in its best shape, our uh, this uh, type of report is a relet of hope that one day everything might change for the better. Also, the REAC and CSIS paper does not pursue the goal of uh, providing overarching and immediate solutions uh, to the whole range of problems we face and relieve us of the burden of mutual distrust right away. The report is excellent in uh, outlining possible strategic perspective and I'm sure will be studied in detail in many capitals. It is very commendable that the study represents one of the first and uh, I strongly believe one of the best attempts in recent years to find the way out of current deadlock in our relations and to focus on tangible steps no matter how timid they might seem uh, at this moment. Um, I would not uh, uh, dwell too deeply into the uh, contents of the report. I would like to share as a policy planner for the Russian Foreign Ministry some um, some of my personal thoughts and uh, kind of philosophical um, assessment what we have now and what can happen in the future with our relations. And uh, the core question that we all should answer too is why our countries always fail to reach a desired balance uh, regardless of how hard we work on building bridges. The notion is that we should not improve our relations for the sake uh, of the improvement. We should advance them for the benefit of both countries and uh, play so-called uh, non-zero-sum game or win-win game. 
uh, mutually beneficial. Looking back uh, at history, uh, unfortunately, we see the opposite. Our desire to get along with the U.S. and the desire of the U.S. to get along with Russia for the sake of mere friendship uh, proved to be a rather cautionary tale. Unrealistic expectations always bring us to the same end, whether we want to surpass an unpleasant legacy of uh, previous period of relations or to find another centerpiece topic uh, for discussion in international sphere, in arms control, etc. It always turns ad hoc episodic engagement that does not add to the overall quality of the relationship. And uh, that ad hoc operation doesn't uh, help to improve the relations. Uh, and the positive effect of such excellent deals like New START Treaty or the uh, managing the Iran nuclear program or eliminating serial chemical stock, the positive effect of those uh, agreements and cooperation is very, is very short. And relations usually get back to the some uh, shaky, uh, shaky situation. And uh, at this moment, frankly speaking, our relations, they uh, remind, like, uh, remind fire ravaged house. Uh, the house was burned down, the dozer leveled up the site, and the wind and the rain dispersed the ashes. So uh, why did it happen? Uh, it happened because the building was too flimsy. There was no regular bilateral agenda between our countries. Simply put, uh, uh, for example, uh, we lack the strong economic relations, trade relations like the United States has with China. We don't have special, deeply historically rooted uh, uh, special relations like United States uh, has with the United Kingdom. And uh, for years we were making the same, uh, same mistake, I think. There was uh, irresistible temptation, temptation in our bureaucracies to assume that the relations shall always be based on the quality of dialogue between, personal dialogue between our leaders. But it's an illusion because uh, chemistry, of course, is beneficial, but it is uh, uh, only one of many options and uh, should be derivative of the main function, the relationship itself, not the opposite. So. Uh, uh, the chemistry between leaders is designed for giving additional, uh, uh, additional impetus to address outstanding issues. And uh, can you imagine that uh, if it turns out that there is no opportunity for substantive, substantive uh, cooperation and the chemistry at some point suddenly evaporates, the relations inevitably uh, will uh, roll back to yet another uh, chilly situation or even confrontation. And uh, this will uh, continue unless we will find strength in ourselves to change the paradigm. So uh, I think we uh, should uh, now be very patient and try to uh, find a way to move away from the current confrontational mode uh, to to toward a more controlled and stabilized state of things. And meanwhile, we should start uh, meticulously looking for any undamaged roots and sprouts of hope at those charred remains of once dynamic and promising Russia-US relations. Our common task is to rebuild from the scratch our bilateral agenda. We have to uh, start a new encouraging investment, work together with business communities of both our countries. We have to re reinitiate dialogue between uh, lawmakers. Uh, of our nations, so it can be difficult in current situation, but still uh, we have to try. We have to foster humanitarian ties and uh, uh, lead the conversation between the civil societies and restore cultural exchanges and uh, facilitate youth and uh, uh, academic intercommunication. So uh, if we manage to do that, to, up to some point we will lay stronger, solid foundation for our relations, and uh, we will not uh, have to uh, rely on the fragile toppings. And uh, as once our great ambassador to the United States, Anatoly Dobrynin, wisely put it, we should continuously weave the thread of mutual understanding. And uh, uh, in the foreseeable future, we uh, can even start to gather uh, fruitful results. But once again, I would reiterate, but at this point, a lot depends on wisdom, political willing, strength to start healing our relations. It would be a great mistake if we continue on the course of arrogance 
towards each other because uh, snapping into confrontational spin then becomes almost unavoidable and the possibility of reversing the negative tendency almost impossible. But I, I don't want to believe that uh, Russia-US relations are doomed to continuous failures. We live in an increasingly um, interconnected uh, and at the same time uh, increasingly unstable world. Our two nations still serve uh, not only as pillars of international security and stability, but we, uh, we've always been uh, creative generators of world agenda. And moreover, we have uh, great potential of mutually enriching cooperation and uh, it's enormous, so untapped. It, uh, be it economy, be it innovative spheres of science and technology, be it a space exploration for the benefit of the humankind. And we have to treasure that. We always have to remember about that potential and take every step possible to realize it on a mutually respectful and friendly, in, in, a, in a friendly manner. We have always to remember about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so for those who don't know, I'm Olga Olakar. I direct the Russia and Eurasia program here at uh, CSIS. Uh, what we're going to do from here is um, everybody here is going to have a chance to speak. I'm going to talk a little bit about the report, the executive summary of which you have in front of you. After that, I'm going to turn uh, the, uh, the floor over to my colleague, for, uh, the Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council, Andrei Kartunov. Uh, following which, I'm going to ask uh, two of our colleagues who have participated in this process. Um, Kathleen Hicks, uh, sitting to my left, the Senior Vice President and Henry Kissinger Chair um, and Director of the International Security Pro uh, Program here at CSIS. And then I'm going to give the last word uh, to Sergey Rogoff, currently the Scientific Director of the Institute of U.S. and Canada Studies at the Russian Academy of Sciences and formerly, uh, for many years, Director. Uh, of that institute. Um, I'm going to try to be brief. Um, I want to say, you know, I think the comments we heard from Dr. Hamry, from Minister Ivanov, and from Mr. Stepanov really set the stage um, for this discussion. Um, this is something that when we started, uh, we started in a world where U.S. Russian relations really were in a tailspin. And we knew that this was dangerous and unsustainable. We were worried about the absence of dialogue. And, but though we realized that uh, the many differences in perspective and interests that our governments and our people bring to the table, we thought cooperation was, was pretty important, imperative in fact. Not because we thought that it was um, a good for its own sake, um, or even just a means to end the developing standoff which worried us. Rather, we knew from past experience that um, for all of our differences, the United States and Russia do share key interests, advancement of which is in our mutual and actually in the global good. And we knew that failure to cooperate in those areas and failure to talk about the areas where we disagree would be of great detriment to US, Russian, and global security. Um, I'll also say that we tried to break from the mold a little bit in the way we approach this. Um, all too often, Russian experts in US foreign policy talk to American experts in Russian foreign policy. Um, being one of the latter, I think this is all really important, but we also wanted to make sure that we had at the table experts in other key areas, the key areas that are important to our relationship, to talk to their counterparts on the other side. And we had a couple of meetings at once like that, but then what we wanted to do was we wanted to ask some of our participants to pair up a Russian and an American, and ask them to together write papers on some, not all, I know you're gonna look at this list of things and say, wait, there are important things that aren't here. Absolutely, not all, but a few of the key issues that we thought it was important to move forward on and to write them together. Really, it's a way of cheating a little bit. It's a way of asking one person from each side to have the fights that often we have in large groups around a table. But we also thought that by doing this, um, we would, we would create an atmosphere that, that enabled solutions to be found and solutions that would respond to at least some of the concerns on both sides. And, and indeed, the process was in many ways a microcosm of the relationship. 
And I'm really pleased uh, with the results. You have the executive summary um, here in front of you. Looking forward to publishing the full report in just a few weeks. I'm gonna quickly highlight a few of the key themes. We can talk about more of them in Q&A and uh, draw on some of the authors who are present. Um, you know, we've got, uh, if you look at this, it's economics, energy, the Arctic, Euro-Atlantic security, the Middle East, strategic stabilities, cybersecurity, and countering terrorism and extremism, all really crucial topics. All topics where cooperation would be very good for us and failure to cooperate could mean uh, that things get far, far worse. So in the economic sphere, I just want to highlight uh, Victor Supian and Bill Courtney, uh, who's here, uh, call for strength in business dialogue even for as long as sanctions remain in place. Um, and they argue not to just try to build economic relations, but to use this as a forum for building mutual understanding. Assuming that there's progress made on Minsk and sanctions can be lifted, uh, they propose a strategic economic commission and other mechanisms that can truly develop an institutionalized trade for both countries' benefits. On energy, uh, Sarah Ladislaw and Andrei Karneyev, working with um, Suzanne Freeman, urge our leaders to focus on technical issues and to depoliticize the energy sphere. I think uh, when they were first uh, drafting this, they also were looking to focus a bit on climate issues, but we're not as certain that the current political climate is really going to support that. Arctic cooperation has uh, generally been a success story, and our authors, uh, Heather Conley and Andrei Zagorski, uh, emphasize that in their work. The two countries have no boundary disputes. They've cooperated on an international fisheries agreement, on an Arctic Coast Guard forum. To keep this a success story in an atmosphere of heightened rhetoric, they argue that it's critical to exercise restraint as both states develop their defense postures in the region, and that it's critical to, again, keep the communication flowing. Europe. Uh, Europe is the tough one. As uh, authors Mikhail Troitsky and Lynn Davis recognize, it, this, is, uh, this is at the heart of the challenges for this relationship. And of course, as always, it's one of the areas where cooperation is going to be most crucial. First steps uh, include preventing dangerous accidents and incidents. But no less important is keeping the conversation going on Ukraine, uh, which of course is uh, it's the catalyst that, uh, it's not the cause really of the problems in the relationship, but it is where they became so self-evident uh, a few short years ago. And conversations on Ukraine can't just be bilateral. Uh, everybody has to be at the table. And that creates, that creates a lot of new challenges because even if the US and Russia were to agree, they all, there are the other countries of Europe, not just Ukraine, not just the EU states, uh, that also have to be at the table, also have to have a voice. Um, but uh, the authors also do argue that uh, in regards to countries that are not uh, members of NATO, uh, European states like Ukraine, it does behoove both the United States and Russia to make their own policies clearer. The Middle East is often lauded as an area where there is tremendous opportunity for greater cooperation. But challenges often arise uh, due to the very different approaches the two countries have taken. And with Russia's role in the region growing, uh, one can imagine that this could actually become more of a challenge. Jim Dobbins and Irina Zvagelske argue that the reconstruction of Syria, once that becomes feasible, and coordination of policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, various Kurdish groups will be key to both states as they, be, as they become, as they continue to be active in this very volatile part of the world. Uh, they look for areas to cooperate also on Libya, on Afghanistan, on um, the Arab-Israeli conflict, and on building regional security structures, though they also do recognize the many difficulties inherent in this. Strategic stability has long been at the core of U.S.-Russian uh, cooperation, as uh, former Foreign Minister Ivanov uh, has already discussed. Uh, Sergei Rogov, uh, working with Sharon Skosony of CSIS, um, wrote this paper. Um, and both talk about many of the things that Minister Ivanov mentioned, the leading role our two countries play on this stage, the need not just to move forward on this agenda, uh, but also to recognize the changed environment in which we exist. Dr. Rogov will no doubt speak more about this in his remarks, 
I will say that speaking for myself, I am very concerned that if we do not resolve our differences on the INF Treaty, I don't know how we move forward on arms control. And I do think that failure to move forward on arms control could be destruct destructive not just to our relationship, but not to put too fine a point on it, to global security for the long term. And this is one of the things that keeps me up at night. Cybersecurity keeps other people up at night and presents a different set of challenges. <laughs> What's interesting is that historically the US and Russia have been able to find some common ground on the broad issues here. But today the discussion is overshadowed by, well, the fact that the US government has found that Russia relied in part on cyber espionage to gather information, which was then released through WikiLeaks uh, in an effort to influence the US election. Russia, for its part, of course, denies both the espionage and involvement in the leaks. But this, is, this has become a critical point of tension and it raises real questions for the future of both traditional cyber threats, um, cybersecurity, and also foreign, um, foreign interference. But we do kind of, you know, because this overshadows some of the things we used to talk about, I think it's important to raise them again. And so, so the two authors who were involved in this. This is a conversation that isn't about spying and leaking information, right? It's a conversation about two other things. One is the use of cyber tools as weapons, for instance, to weaken infrastructure um, and uh, to, to actually hurt another country, weapons of war. This is uh, something where the two countries, US and Russia, have held different views. Uh, Russia has wanted to treat cyber weapons, at least in the, internet, in the context of international law, as on par with weapons of mass destruction, while the United States has argued that these are more like uh, conventional weapons, that they should be bound by the same laws that govern warfare as a whole. The other piece of this that I think is really interesting is the very different positions of the two countries on um, the internet's role in freedom of expression. Uh, so our two authors, Jim Lewis and Pavel Sharikov, actually ended up providing separate drafts on this topic in keeping with the challenges in this environment of developing a single voice. But both do urge uh, continued dialogue, and I think that is, uh, that's the bottom line here. Uh, finally, efforts to counter terrorism and violent extremism have been getting a lot of attention lately as possible grounds for cooperation. Um, they are very important to both our countries at the top of both of our security agendas. But they have been before, and past efforts have been flummoxed by the very, very different views the two countries have here as well. How US policy is defined going forward may have an impact, but some of the old problems, classification concerns, methods, and so forth will continue to make things difficult. But I do think, and our two authors, Ekaterina Stepanova and Kim Cragen, specialists on, uh, on these topics, also think that there is room to move forward. They urge cooperation and information sharing on experiences, on groups that are breaking uh, laws around the world, and on practices. Uh, they urge working groups at uh, the government level, at uh, track two and track one and a half, and generally more collaboration. So in closing, I want to emphasize how pleased I am with the work we've done, how eager I am to keep it going, how pleased I, was, I, I am to hear the, um, the desire to keep it going on both sides. I think we've barely scratched the surface. I think you know, the challenge here is that knowing that we have to cooperate has never been enough. We really do need to chart out paths to make it work. I sometimes um, cynically think that we do better um, we do better making deals on things where we fundamentally disagree, because then you can have a give a take, than we do on moving forward on areas that we actually all know are in our mutual interest, because we're so suspicious that we're wondering if the other guy is getting a step, a step ahead of us on those. I want to keep working with um, the Russian International Affairs Council to dig deeper and try to figure out ways around this so that we can work together to make uh, both of our countries and all of our neighbors safer. Uh, so I'm going to turn the floor over to Andrei Kortunov uh, for his comments. Thank you, Olga. Let me start uh, with a quote uh, from the Godfather, part three. There is a, a scene there when uh, Don Carleone, the junior, Michael Carleone, uh, discusses mafia wars with one of his associates. And uh, the discussion becomes quite emotional, and then he states, never hate your 
enemies. It affects your judgment. Uh, even if we assume that Russia and the United States are enemies, which is an assumption which still has to be proved, many question this assumption, but even if we start with this assumption, it's really important uh, to think rationally about each other and to try to understand each other. Otherwise, our judgments will be affected by our emotions. And what I see today, unfortunately, in the U.S.-Russian relations, that emotions fly high, and sometimes rationality is out of the picture. I'm not that surprised to see it in Moscow, frankly speaking. I'm more surprised to see it in this city. I think that this notion of political correctness is definitely not something which the United States can take as the tradition of this country. And I think that indeed hatred, which we see in plenty, on both sides of the barricades obscures our vision and uh, indeed affects our judgments about each other. Now, let me say that it is exactly why I feel that this project is so important. And uh, I would venture to say that, uh, in my view, CSIS exercised political courage to enter this project right now with our council, uh, and uh, I'm really grateful to, the, to CSIS, and uh, I'm grateful to Olga uh, for her commitment and her patience and your dedication to this project. And we too. And we too. We too, for us. Yeah, but we are, you know. We're, we're, we're grateful to you. We're, 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 we're courageous people, you know. <laughs> we are, <laughs> but not always we find uh, courageous partners on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, let me, I don't want to repeat what uh, Olga has just said, uh, but uh, in a way, you know, the list of the topics that uh, we try to cover uh, reminds me of a kind of investment policy. You know, these uh, areas of potential corporations are our startups. They are very diverse. Uh, some of them are relatively non-toxic uh, and are probably not very complicated. Some of them are very controversial uh, and uh, are very difficult to approach. Uh, some of these areas uh, can be uh, uh, covered in the framework of our bilateral relations. Uh, some of them require multilateral uh, cooperation with other stakeholders and other partners. But as you know, if you take startups, usually about two out of ten or one out of ten survive. I hope that we will do better than that. If uh, indeed some of our proposals, let's say in three or four areas, uh, uh, take off, uh, that would be already an accomplishment. Let me also say that uh, though we tried hard to find some common ground, it doesn't mean that we should not uh, discuss issues on which we cannot agree. I think one of the problems in the relations between Russia and the United States, and Russia in the West at large for many, many years, was that uh, we preferred uh, to sweep the garbage under the rug, under the carpet, instead of dealing with it. And that's why, you know, this dialogue should also include a very frank, very candid, maybe not always pleasant discussion about uh, the differences, about disagreements, about contradictions. To emphasize these is equally important. And I hope that uh, something like that will happen in our future cooperation. <laughs> Let me also say that um, in my opinion, uh, the uh, advantage of this particular approach is that uh, when we talk about these areas, none of these areas suggest that one side should make a concession to the other, that one side uh, should somehow compromise in its principles, deviate uh, from its interests, 
and uh, somehow appease the other side. It's not the case, because uh, unilateral concessions do not work. They bake fire sooner or later. And that's, again, something that we saw in the bilateral relations between our two countries. So we hope that um, you know, this initiative will be continued. And if we are able to demonstrate that even now, even after these unfortunate political circumstances, we can still work together, I think that would be quite an accomplishment. And let me uh, end up uh, with a, a kind of lyrical digression, personal experience. I arrived to this city for the first time as a very young graduate student. And that was back in uh, 1984. I came here to serve as a trainee with the Soviet embassy under the wise, under the wise guidance and supervision of Sergei Rogov. And uh, when I came here, it was not definitely the best time in the relations between Moscow and Washington. It was after Afghanistan, uh, after the United States boycotted the Moscow Olympic Games and uh, Star, Russia. Star Wars. Star Wars. Uh, and on top of that, uh, we had this unfortunate uh, uh, Korean uh, airline. We didn't even have direct uh, air, air traffic between Washington and Moscow. If you recall, we flew to this city from Kaliningrad, and, and from, from Montreal, so. And uh, basically, you know, when the, the, our embassy was like a fortress. Uh, and uh, if somebody at that stage in fall of 1984 would have told me that in a year we would have perestroika, and in five years, Gorbachev and Bush the senior would meet uh, in Malta and formally end the Cold War, I wouldn't believe it. I said, no, you're dreaming, it's a pirate. It, it simply cannot happen. So miracles do happen, but miracles do not come from nowhere. They are a product uh, of uh, commitment, integrity, and hard work. So I hope that I will live long enough to see another miracle in the relations between our two great countries. Thank you. And, and, and we will work to make that miracle happen, right? That's, that's the, um, I, I'm gonna turn the floor uh, over to Kathleen Hicks. Thanks very much to Olya and congratulations to Olya and Andre and all the authors um, who contributed to this volume. Um, when government-to-government -government relations run smoothly, often these sorts of academic second track or track 1.5 engagements can seem like a luxury or maybe even we're quizzical about why we're doing them. And then suddenly when things stall or even fail, um, they become a lifeline. And the sad truth is they can't start on a dime. They have to be built, as has been said by multiple people here, um, it, by trust, personal relationships that have been developed over years and for a long period of time. So I just want to say, even though I'm, you know, a, not a grantee, if the grant is for you, I'm very appreciative to the Carnegie um, Corporation for investing in this because this is a time in which we need these um, engagements. And the time may come when there's a miracle and we feel we don't, but frankly, we probably still will. Um, and we'll be grateful that we've had this um, track in which to have these conversations. Um, we really have ushered in, I think, in the, across the world, beyond our two countries, but to include our two countries, an era of pretty significant unpredictability. Um, that's driven by a lot of factors. Some of them are nation state factors. Some go well beyond that. And there could be, in that unpredictability, some opportunity for U.S.-Russian relations. I don't, I don't want to foreclose that possibility. I think it's obvious that could happen. But of course, as a, somebody who works on security, I worry mostly about the risks of that. Um, so I think Olya and Andre's very first sentence of this executive summary contains a really important idea, which is that small is also big. Sometimes working in um, areas where the light is not shining, where reputation does not feel completely on the line, where politics are not um, ever present and you're not going to show up on a 24-hour news network, whether Russian run or US run, um, you can actually get some things done. I think in the study, the areas that most stood out to me in that sense were the Arctic issues, um, 
some of the issues not discussed, like civilian space and science, which um, came up previously. And then in some areas, if you could get to the right place, strategic stability, where we have the probably the longest standing, most enduring personal relationships, depth of technical expertise between our countries, and I think mutual respect. I agree with Olya, now is not a great time because of INF concerns. But again, I think there is a lot of promise in that area that can continue to be built on behind the scenes for when the time is ripe. Um, I think on the big ticket items, and here I might disagree a little bit with Olya, I think the trust deficit right now is so immense and the reputational costs are seemingly so big, and the daily revelations slash misinformation slash whatever you want to call it are so overwhelming that it makes it extremely difficult. So um, part of what we should also be talking about is how we change the information environment in which we're operating, how we reduce those temperatures so that these more technical areas um, can have some movement. And I think the biggest thing that ought to motivate us is, is thinking about what we have mutually at stake there's a lot, but I think if I were to pick one word to put at the top, it would be miscalculation. I think we don't currently believe, many of us in the United States, that the Russians wish to attack the United States directly in a large conventional or nuclear way. I think the Russians, I hope, believe the same about the United States. Um, you know, war is not often predicted, but sometimes it comes, and often that's because it comes because there's been some miscalculation and misunderstanding. So anything we can do to reduce that sense of misunderstanding about where our interests lie, being more predictable about our actions, being clearer in our actions and intent linking, I think that's right at the top. And if it helps to move in some of these more technical areas to get to that, level of trust and security, I think that's important. Let me just end by saying um, we, we are soon at CSIS to release another report on U.S. strategy for Russia, and I know when that comes out, many people will think of it as particularly hard-hitting and maybe in market contrast to the discussion, you know, when I'm involved in that, that I'm involved in today. But I raise it only to say that even in that report that we are releasing, even in the hardest-hitting, you know, um, articulation in Washington, maybe, of how one should think about U.S.-Russian relations and U.S. strategy toward Russia. Cooperation, finding channels for dialogue, for actually moving forward on issues of mutual um, intent and mutual gain is vital, and we will highlight that as well. Again, I would emphasize that, first and foremost, I'd highlight the need to always have good crisis communications improve our transparency measures, maintain those strategic uh, stability, nuclear non-proliferation, arms control dialogues, those things that directly relate to these existential threats that the U.S. and Russian arsenals uh, hold for the world. And again, I think the Arctic may be a particularly um, cool zone, sorry, um, in which to uh, dial, down the, dial down the temperature and uh, make a little progress. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Kath. And just uh, kind of to underline that, the forthcoming report, and I hope, I hope you all come uh, to the release for that as well, a lot of the same people, at CSIS at least, worked on both of these. And I think that uh, that speaks to both the, um, the, w the way we look at Russia. That it's not that, um, that we don't understand the challenges when we urge cooperation. We urge cooperation in large because we do understand the challenges. I'm going to give uh, the last word to somebody who has been working these issues for a very long time and who knows, uh, knows them uh, better than I think most of us can hope to, and that is, uh, of course, Sergei Rogov. Thank you, Olga. I also want to join my colleagues to an expression of our gratitude uh, for your commitment. Uh, I first came to the CSIS in 1973 on the K Street. Uh, and I met some of the people from the CSIS uh, for many years. Uh, I know John Humphrey for almost as long as I know Bill Courtney, whom I know for 30 years. And I must tell you that never I experienced this uncertainty 
frightening and uncertainty about Russian-American relations as today. The relationship is almost as bad as it was during the Cold War. Uh, the stereotype, propaganda stereotypes of the Cold War are back, and what's especially dangerous, that the policymaker believe their own propaganda. Propaganda has become for st uh, a substitute for strategy. The economic relationship uh, looks like, uh, with sanctions, etc., like an economic warfare. There is almost no normal political dialogue between uh, Russian and American government. Very few formal contacts. No business as usual. And in the military area, the tensions are pretty high, and the arms control regime uh, sometimes looks like it's on the verge of a total collapse. And that's why I want to talk about the, the subject uh, on which um, I and Sharon were working uh, during this project, the uh, subject of strategic stability. Can we really uh, stabilize the relationship between Russia and the United States and prevent further deterioration? Uh, that really requires a very serious effort because, well, the arms control mechanisms which we negotiated during the Cold War uh, today are badly shaken. And sometimes they don't quite correspond to the realities of the international system and of technological development. Uh, the original arms control treaties were negotiated when there was a bipolar international system. It doesn't exist anymore. It's a polycentric international system. Even if Russia and the United States are able to agree on anything, and we, that is unlikely, uh, there is still China and a few other players, players, and many have nuclear weapons. And the, the technological development produced a situation when uh, many strategic targets, which uh, in, during the f first Cold War was possible to destroy only with nuclear weapons, with megatons, uh, today could be attacked and destroyed or neutralized by non-nuclear means. And that was the essence of uh, the discussion which we have uh, in our part of the report, how to deal with this problem. Definitely, Russia and the United States should continue uh, bilateral negotiations. Uh, in my opinion, it, we, we, still, we still can reduce to lower numbers, uh, but uh, we cannot do it alone all the way, without others engaged and without taking into account additional factors which have an impact on strategic stability like long-range range, uh, precision guidance conventional weapons, uh, ballistic missile defense, cyber weapons, and possibly space weapons, space-based weapons. Uh, apparently, apparently um, there could be no universal solution to all those challenges because, well, uh, the legally binding treaties establishing ceilings and uh, sub-ceilings, uh, it's going to be impossible to apply to the uh, challenge of the controlling cyber weapons. How, how, it's simply impossible to do. Uh, but in other cases, Russia and the United States could advance legally binding agreements and try to engage other countries into uh, some kind of arms control regime, even if it's unilateral commitment not to build up. Uh, I can, of course, will talk um, a lot about it, uh, uh, but we don't have time to do it. Since I, I want to spend the remaining uh, few minutes which I have, and presume I have them, on the subject which Olga mentioned, and that's the, the, the trouble with the INF uh, treaty. If the INF treaty collapses, uh, most probably the START treaty won't survive. And that would mean that for the first time since 1972, we are not going to have any legally binding uh, restrictions uh, in the Russian-American 
strategic balance. Uh, that would be extremely dangerous, in particular since we have all kind of accidents uh, as a result of expansion of NATO's infrastructure closer to Russian borders. And uh, such accidents can produce an escalation. Uh, 30 or 40 years ago, some of the people in this room were engaged in thinking about the escalation scenarios and how to stop them. Apparently, uh, today it's not uh, such a fashionable topic, but let's face it, it can happen. And that's why it's uh, absolutely necessary to preserve the INF Treaty. In particular, uh, we have to do it since the level of trust between our two governments. So I was just a teenager during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I remember. And the example is mutual accusations on the INF Treaty. The United States violation of the by development and production and now deployment of the land-based uh, cruise missile, which is prohibited by uh, using medium-range missiles uh, for testing purposes of American ballistic missile defense, using long-range drones uh, for attack purposes, which can uh, long-range drones, which can deliver. Uh, military payload at a pretty far distance, and deployment to shore system and later in, uh, in 2018 in Poland. Uh, and Aegis Ashore can launch not only SM-3 interceptors, but can also launch And now Aegis Ashore is on the ground. Thus, it can launch a tomahawk from the ground. Thus, Aegis Ashore becomes the ground launcher for cruise missiles. And that is a clear violation of the INF Treaty, which, by the way, American mass media never mentions. Russia is accused as, a, as established fact. Russia violated. Russia is not complying. Russia should be punished. We should do this. We should do that. The issue of MK-41 Aegis Ashore is almost completely ignored, except maybe by a few experts, some of whom are present in, in, in this room. And uh, could it be resolved? Could the, this problem be resolved? Yes, there is a technical solution. Uh, the launcher tubes could be technically modified so that probably when Russia tested it's sea-launched cruise missiles, and INF Treaty permits testing sea-launched cruise missiles like the caliber, this missile which we used in Syria. Uh, it's permitted to test them on the ground, not to deploy those issues. If we can agree on them, strategic stability, I hope I will live long enough to see it. Right. Presumably, you can't mistake a sea-based deployment. There are so many topics like that, and I welcome more suggestions for things that we want to make sure um, stay on our agenda. But you know, at this point, I, I do want to also underline that th this isn't meant to be comprehensive. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. May I add, yeah, of course, Sergey. As a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, which, by the way, now is facing a very serious crisis. But as far as the Russian-American relations are concerned, yeah, you're a corresponding member. I am a full member. <laughs> uh, unfortunately. Uh, so, well, uh, the uh, Russian-American scientific uh, exchanges and cooperation was badly tied by economic sanctions, no business as usual. And in very many uh, cases, well, they just stopped. I have to admit that the Russian government, in my view, unwisely also decided to break uh, very important uh, agreements on cooperation. But we still continue to do, and by the way, something is done, maybe you heard about the CSAC, 
the National Academy of Sciences umbrella group for arms control. And we uh, are resuming again discussions, including discussions of strategic stability, exactly six baskets which I mentioned, strategic nuclear weapons, non-strategic nuclear weapons, conventional weapons, uh, ballistic missile defense, um, space and cyber. Unfortunately, the day before yesterday, when there was the General Congress of the Russian Academy of Sciences, uh, which was supposed to elect by secret ballot for another five years the new president of the Russian Academy of Sciences. As a result of some stupid intrigues, uh, the election was postponed for six months. And this is, this is a very bad shock for our, all Russian scientific community because that was really a, a bureaucratic pressure which uh, produced this unpleasant result. What I, I, I totally agree that we have to uh, <clears throat> continue our cooperation between our uh, scientists. We, had, we have a lot of experience coming from the many years ago. And uh, we, here we need, we cannot on the level of our group suggest something. Here we can suggest only political will and political decision. Scientists, among them, they know each other very well in different fields, and they know how to cooperate, and they know where we, they can produce real results. That's why here we try to select topics, maybe where we can say some new words, something new. Um, to suggest some, something to academicians or scientists, it's not our, I think, that uh, objective. Our objective will be to support the necessity to develop and not to cut. Uh, political games, this is one thing, and scientific other. When you cut uh, relations, it will be more difficult maybe to restore them than in, in other fields because you may lose all this continuity in the cooperation. And we had, and still in some areas, we have cooperation. I agree totally with you. Okay, thank you. So now I am going to take a, a round of questions, and uh, then we'll come back. So please, here in the front, uh, please wait. Please wait for the microphone. Please do identify yourself, sure. and please do make it a question. <coughs> Hi, uh, my name is Andrei Sitov. I'm a Russian reporter here in Washington D.C. I'm with TASS. Uh, thank you for doing the panel. Uh, I've uh, I've been here for 20 years. I've seen many reports like this, and and, and uh, they are all fine. Uh, the the problem is that the relations. Uh, keeps growing worse, not better. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to stick to the practical aspects of the relationships. And uh, obviously, being a Russian, I'm biased. I'm, uh, I'm uh, obviously, I think we are in the right. Uh, luckily for us, uh, the, the U.S. seemed to to uh, make a choice in this past election where uh, they said, "Yeah, we we need to uh, to." make up, we, we, we need to work together and all of that. And now we are seeing what we are seeing in Washington, D.C., right, in the past few weeks. The poisonous atmosphere that requires a miracle <laughs> for, for the relations to restart. So even though I, I believe the Russians to be right, mostly, <laughs> uh, I want to ask the ladies if there is anything that they can see that Russia can do in this current atmosphere that would produce an impression. Because I, uh, frankly, I don't see anything like this. I don't see anything that would change the atmosphere, especially on the Hill. I don't know about the administration, because the administration doesn't give enough signals. But even like on the Hill, uh, what can we do in practical terms, aside from the wonderful report, <laughs> that would uh, at least uh, make people uh, Take a pause and reconsider. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, right behind. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, I think all the issues are on the table. Uh, I'm Lauren Hershey. I happen to be celebrating today uh, the 30th anniversary of taking a trip with a group of attorneys and state judges to Moscow and Leningrad. That was 1987, and there were Two words that were whispered to us, one was perestroika, the other was glasnost, and we were told, we wish to talk about perestroika, we don't wish to talk about glasnost. Uh, I'd like to uh, make a suggestion. 
having been a Fulbright Scholar earlier in my career prior to being a lawyer, uh, that the uh, embassy here in Washington, D.C., host a reception for the Fulbrighters. This was done in 1989 at the old embassy on 16th Street. It was also done in about 1992 or 93 at the new embassy in Upper Georgetown. I'd like your response to that, please. Great. Uh, let's take one more in the back. Hi, uh, Paul Mandelson, uh, formerly of The Hill. I guess I'm a CSIS coffee freeloader now. Um, so uh, I wrote down my question, so it is actually a question. Um, there's one name that hasn't been mentioned today, which I find uh, surprising, and that is Donald Trump. Um, we've gone an hour and a half, and I don't think that's possible in this town. Um, but based on some of the comments the president made during the campaign, it would seem uh, that there's more prospects for cooperation in the future between the two countries. Do you see expanded opportunities in the new administration, and how has this report changed since November? And if it hasn't, should it? Thank you. All right. Um, I propose we just go down the line. Everyone is free to answer or not answer whatever they wish. <laughs> Um, maybe uh, I should answer the, the question, what the sense of writing reports if they don't have any impact on policies? That was the, the substance of uh, the, the, the meaning of your question. Well, there is a difference between the academic community, experts, who always try to invent a plan how to save the world, and the policymakers uh, who are guided uh, not by those wonderful ideas, but by other considerations. And uh, not often uh, those ideas uh, are accepted by the, the government officials. Uh, my good friend Igor Ivanov, when he was a foreign minister, and I would send him my brilliant ideas, would say, yes, but. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, but, <laughs> but sometimes yes. Anyway, uh, nevertheless, uh, I think that both in this country and in Russia, there is a community of experts which uh, sometimes uh, are able to propose some new ideas, some new approaches. And uh, I'm not trying to boast, but take the, into account the INF problems. It really can explode at any moment. And maybe what uh, I was talking about, or some other ideas, because some other people propose what to do, will help us to fix the problem. Uh, as far as uh, American side is concerned, my impression, and since I, I'm a private guy with no official connection, uh, my impression is that the new U.S. administration is not interested at all in what think tanks propose, except very few, which uh, look like, more like tanks than like think. You know, I'd like also to approach the, issue, the, the question that was addressed to the latest, but I think that uh, Russian voice uh, uh, should be also heard here, since we're talking about what Russia could do. And first of all, you know, we understand that the current attitudes towards Russia have a lot of momentum, and nothing will change the current attitudes too fast. Whatever Russia might do will be probably used against it. They say, you know, this is a another manifestation of Putin's propaganda, you know, he doesn't really mean it and uh, uh, we shouldn't buy it at the listed price. I can imagine that no matter how benign the Russian intentions might be, that they will be taken with a grain of salt. However, it does mean that we should not try. And uh, if I were to give advice to the Russian leadership about some symbolic actions that can be taken right away, without waiting for the summit, without uh, you know, taking a pause in the relationship, I would uh, identify at least three 
evident measures. First, reconsider the Dima Yakolev law. I think it was ill-conceived. I think it has to be changed. Maybe in consultations with Americans, maybe you know, we need more monitoring of you know, these adopted kids uh, uh, who moved to the United States, but I think that this is something that has to be done. Second, restore uh, some of the educational uh, exchange programs that were canceled. FLEX program. I don't know whether you're familiar with this program, but it was an opportunity for Russian teenagers to come to this country for, I think, half a year and uh, to live in American families and to get some experience and then to get back to Russia with their new knowledge of the United States. I think that all these speculations of these people are likely to, to, to emigrate or to become liberals, uh, these allegations do not hold water. Basically, it's not the case. But to give a chance to younger people to broaden their horizons would be important. I think it was a mistake to cancel these programs. And third, again, very simple symbolic action. We should revisit the list of uh, undesirable institutions, majority of which happen to be US NGOs. Because I can tell you for sure that some of the institutions that got on the list have nothing to do with politics. They were trying to help US-Russian relations. They were trying to help Russia as a country. I think that that would create a signal. Again, you know, it will not change the attitudes overnight, but we have to start with something. If uh, in exchange the United States can show, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, benevolence towards Russia, that would be great. Then it would probably have some kind of small chain reaction. But that's what I would go. But I don't know what the, the, the US participants would say to that. Well, I will answer briefly on the new administration and opportunities for Russia-American relations. Uh, President Trump was elected, and uh, he uh, was, uh, I believe, the only candidate who was campaigning on the basis that uh, Russian-American relations should and could be improved. And uh, uh, I believe that the voters who elected President Trump also voted for the positive changes in our agenda. Uh, so uh, that gives a reason to uh, remain mildly optimistic about the perspective of our relations. Of course, there will be contacts uh, on different levels when uh, uh, the national security team and fully assembled here in Washington, D.C., and when the policy review on different issues will be concluded. So, uh, uh, as uh, my president said and Foreign Minister Lavrov said, we are actually really want to improve relations and are ready to go as far uh, in the direction as our American partners are willing to, to go. <clears throat> First of all, about this report. You are 20 years here, and I was in Moscow, and I know also all reports. This is different for many reasons. I will mention only two reasons. First of all, the main objective of this report is to demonstrate that we still civilized people and can speak together, sit together and work on very difficult issues. Because if you see that what is happening with our ambassador, that people, you proposed reception in our amb embassy, but people now afraid to see Russian ambassador. <laughs> this is a stupid in my 40 years of diplomatic career, never I saw such a situation. The role of, dip of diplomats and of ambassadors is precisely to speak with the people, to explain our policy, and to listen to the policy of the other side, and to transmit it to, to Moscow. If you don't speak, how we want to understand what, what is our policy? That's why you have so many speculations. In that situation, you have to invite him. You have to see him. You have to speak with him. This is, and the, our ambassador here is the, one of the most professionals. I know him for many years. That's why uh, this is what we wanted to demonstrate, that even in these circumstances, 
We have people in both countries who are ready to sit, discuss, try to find common language with all differences, and even to create some suggestions or proposals. When you have contacts as we had on official level, even sometimes we don't need to do this, this kind of reports because we can speak with our people, they have their channels, they are working all the time. But today it was, that's why it was very important this report. That's why this is to, to demonstrate to the public opinion that we have to speak, we have a lot of problems, we, uh, we have these eight or nine topics, but we have many other topics, and we are ready to, to sit together, and it is possible to discuss with Ukraine, with all differences, what we have. That's why this is the second, I will tell you also as professional. When you don't speak with other side, you are losing ideas. When you speak, you go ahead all the time with small steps, big steps, but uh, this is not, I don't criticize anybody, but this is a bad situation. I know from my experience. That's why I'm sure that tomorrow, or in one month, or in two months, or in one year, the situation may, may change, and our professionals, they will need something prepared or some ideas from which they can select. One, two, three points. That's why we are working also for our ministries of foreign affairs, for our administration, to give them some ideas, so to send them some ideas. And they will decide if they can accept or not accept. That's why this report is important from, uh, from that point of view, and we will continue to work on that topics and maybe other topics. Developing uh, ideas, uh, what we uh, mentioned here. Now about... Mm. President Trump. We didn't mention any name, not, so, not only Trump, but if you want to mention, uh, <clears throat> I agree uh, completely with uh, Alec that the role of two presidents in our bilateral relations was very high. Without political dialogue on the highest level, it will be very difficult to restart uh, normal, normal dialogue on other, on other levels. That's why the meeting between our two presidents is very important. Don't wait from that meeting some crucial decisions. What you have to wait from that meeting only signal that both sides we have political will and decision to start dialogue with all problems, with all differences. And that signal in both countries we need, our administrations they need. Receiving such a signals and uh, giving instructions to department, to Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to Ministry of Defense, other department, you have to sit and to start discussing problems and not only problems but solutions. Then you can restart normal dialogue. I don't speak about something, but we speak about trust. How you can have trust if you don't even speak? Without speaking, without uh, putting on the table all your arguments, it's very difficult to move ahead. That's why I am sure that it's necessary, without losing time, to organize um, a meeting between our two presidents and to give that signal to the public opinion, to our administrations of both countries, that it's necessary to work together. It's uh, in our common interest. We have too much problems and we need to cooperate. We, we cannot start uh, every four or eight years from zero. We started well with previous administration, for, then we lost many uh, achievements w w which we reached, and now we're again starting from zero. You cannot, because problems, uh, they, they need continuity, they need common work, and that's why for, for Russia it's the main interest, and we were saying many times, continuity in our relations. We have common long-term strategic interests. We have to define them and to work. And if we have differences, we will continue to have differences. We had differences on Iraq, but we never interrupted our dialogue. 
We had differences in, uh, in Yugoslavia when uh, NATO bombed Yugoslavia, but we never interrupted. And I was sitting with Madden, we prepared resolution 1244, and we, we stopped the war. It means the dialogue is crucial for, for us, for our two countries, because other countries looking. If we don't speak, they, 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 may, may, they can do their, their games. That's why it was so important to create five plus one group. When we were sitting together, preparing our position and speaking with one voice. And that's why I think that we reached the agreement. When we decided with the American administration to eliminate chemical weapons in Syria, together sitting, we, we did it. That's why, this is why it's very important. So there's an obvious dynamic between these two questions and um, I'll go at them in reverse order to sort of point that what is probably obvious out. Um, I certainly didn't attempt to avoid raising the name of the president. Um, uh, that said, um, I think what's... <laughs> now it's just fun not to. Um, but I do think it really points to how complex the U.S. system is. And uh, I think that is bearing itself out as it frankly really always has in U.S. Soviet and U.S. Russian relations from the Congress to, um, and particular members in Congress, to um, the composition of the federal government itself by agency, by stratosphere. Um, there are a lot of divisions and there, you see those playing out on Russia policy as well as other areas. So, you know, the fact that you have, coming to the other piece of the question, you know, the fact that you have someone who is elected who has a viewpoint on Russia that is singular among his party, of those running among his party, I don't think necessarily translated into an, a, um, a sense that the American public was hugely moved in its voting patterns by U.S.-Russia policy. Um, no offense intended. I think the U.S. Amer the public, the electorate votes for a variety of reasons. But it also means the president has obviously, he's, he's most unitary in his capabilities on foreign policy. He'll have the most leeway there, but um, he's not alone. And then you layer on everything else, which is everything we're living every day and every moment, um, particularly if you just you know woke up in the last 48 hours, um, let alone what's come before. It's an incredibly challenging time for someone who wants to push forward a particular agenda that's running smack into the reality of the environment in which we're all living. So I think that really limits the capability for cooperation in these bigger areas. Um, and I completely agree that, you know, it just shows you how you have to maintain those longer term if you will, more technical uh, and personal relationships over time because opportunities are going to open and close. As I said in my remarks, it's an incredibly unpredictable environment. Um, we are contributing to that. President Putin is contributing to that. And lots of other factors are too that are well outside the control of the US and Russia. So this then brings me to the, to the, the wish list. Um, there are a lot of actors in the US system who aren't gonna be easy to win over. Um, but boy, is that an open-ended question. It's what we would call softball. Um, there are a lot of things that Russia could do, whether Russia would ever find itself uh, to believe it in its interest to do, um, that would make a Senator McCain happy or would make you know a great cross-section of the American foreign policy elite happy. The number one thing surely is at this point, obviously, well, give Crimea as a given, and then I think Eastern Ukraine in terms of a clear and obvious um, uh, pull out of Russian, Russia and Russian support. I think shifting to a, boy was this a softball, a post-Assad future in Syria where there's a very clear Russian commitment to an approach that uh, allows more collective participation in a, um, uh, a Syrian government and has a clear exit strategy for the Assad family even while it is um, providing for the Alawites and others to have a measurable piece of that um, security as part of a coalition government. I think a reduction that's very visible in terms of the strategic engagements that are coming from everything from bombers to submarines, some of that, you know, that's very, 
there, we know the difference between the level that is expected and normal among superpowers who have to maintain their readiness uh, for nuclear capability but versus things that seem to be uh, more saber rattling or um, demonstrations of power that nevertheless could trip into miscalculation more readily. Certainly major conventional military exercises, uh, the degree to which we're transparent and warning, the size of those exercises, the proximity of them. Um, to Russia's border with NATO countries. Those are all, I think, areas of obvious um, concern. Um, and I have others, but I'm going to stop there, and I'm also going to leave for Olya this question of how the report shifted okay. over time. Um, so I'm going to start by saying that I love Andre's ideas for things Russia can do. I love them because, man, would they be good for Russia? they'd be good for the United States and that they would build um, better, co uh, better understanding between us, something that we are in danger of uh, jettisoning. And they could save some lives, uh, particularly children's lives, uh, you know, in Russia's orphanage system, Americans. Not to put too fine a point on it, Americans are willing to adopt children ru which, whom Russian families are less willing to adopt for a lot of reasons. Uh, that you know we won't go into, but it's um, the Zima Yakovlev law has hurt those children um, more than it's hurt anybody else. Um, I am going to disagree slightly with Kath in that I would couch the what Russia can do in um, somewhat narrower, narrower, um, a narrower framework. Um, we all have our. Uh, I'd love to have them, and then there are the things that might be accomplished. <laughs> Assad's not going anywhere unless, you know, a horrible accident befalls him. Uh, and even then, I don't know what replaces him. So I'm not, you know, I'm not that sure that Assad going somewhere without uh, a lot of pre-planning is a great idea. I also think that Russia could make progress on Minsk and Ukraine without it being a unilateral concession to the United States. As Andre pointed out earlier, unilateral concessions are probably not a good idea in this security dilemma framed relationship. But Russia could certainly take steps or push uh, the, um, the separatists it has provided support for uh, to take steps. It could also limit that support in ways that are pretty visible that would be, would be strong signals. Um, I also would say one of the advantages of the United States being so secretive on the Russian INF violation is that it leaves room to sort out a path out of that uh, that enables everybody to save face and agree that we're good now. Now, I don't know what that is because I don't know what the details of the violation are, but I do think that's something that Russia could signal willingness to act on based on information the Russian government has that I lack and potentially move forward. Um, I do very, very fundamentally agree with Kath uh, that a little less goading in uh, military activities would be tremendously uh, helpful. How that plays with... Um, President of the United States, Donald Trump, uh, is a different, I know I said it, um, is a different question. And here's what I think. Good policy advice is good policy advice. Uh, you may couch it differently to people with different preferences. But those in the administration and on the Hill who are more interested in an improved relationship with Russia will have an easier time of it and an easier time finding ways forward if good policy advice is followed, right, by both Russia and the United States. They will have a much harder time of it if proponents of a better relationship suggest things that don't make a ton of sense because then there will be opposition to them. Um, as the Trump team firms up and we have a better sense of who's actually advising the president on these key issues, we'll have a better sense of what's possible and what isn't and just how much of a fight all of it's going to be. But in the meantime, we're kind of stuck with the good advice is good advice and, uh, and hope for the best. How did this report change? Um, you know, it didn't change that much. Um, we did, after the election, go back to all of the authors and say, want to do revisions? And a few made some. I think they were mostly revisions of tone rather than substance. You talk to different people, as I said, in different ways based on the assumptions you suspect them to be coming to the table with. 
Uh, as I mentioned before, some things did shift. I think our energy paper did have much more of an emphasis on climate change issues than it does now in an earlier draft. Uh, because some things may be just harder to move forward, even if they're a good policy. Um, but the, the bottom line uh, logic in this report is the same, uh, and as it should be. As I said, good policy is good policy. Let's take another round. Um, uh, Wayne? Olga, next time when we meet, could you give me two hours so I could present my wish list of what the United <laughs> States should do? I, th I think you should write it up, and uh, then we can, uh, we can publish it and have an event around it. Thank you. Uh, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. Olga, I'd like to ask whether the report is going to deal with an issue which I do not see in the executive summary, and that is military-to-military -military contacts. Uh, one of the few areas in which there has been tangible progress under the new administration is that our senior top-level generals have met a couple of times. Unfortunately, they've done so because of the danger that we may start killing each other uh, on the ground in Syria. But after three years of no military-to-military -military contacts, I should hope that the report would reflect the fact that canceling that kind of dialogue as a sanction or countersanction is not just counterproductive, it's dangerous. I admit to a certain bias here since I used to be engaged in this, but I will come back to the principle I enunciated when I was in the Pentagon that as Clemenceau said that war is too important to be left to the generals, peace is too important not to engage the generals. Thank you. Let's take uh, Jill. Thank you. Uh, Jill Doherty from the Wilson Center. Um, I wanted to ask a very specific question for once, which is we're talking about communication, talking more. And that's usually defined as, oh, the presidential commission stopped working, and that was a very good way that both countries could talk. Do you uh, think that it would be a good idea to revive that? Or could you take the structures that we have, just you know, military to military, or education to education, or whatever the government structures are, and revive those conversations? Thank you. Um, and right up front. Thank you very much. I'm from Turkish Radio and Television. My name is Tuna Shandı. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Foreign Minister. Uh, Mr. Foreign Minister, you were the Foreign Minister at the end of 1990s and the beginning of 2000. Uh, and this time, uh, there were no conflict in Syria. There were no economic cooperation between Turkey and Russia. And the relations between Turkey and the United States were good. But now, after 15 or 17 years, uh, there's a war in Syria. There's a conflict between the uh, ideas of Turkey, Russia, and the United States in that region. And there is energy and economic cooperation between Turkey and Russia now. Uh, and the relations with, uh, uh, between the Turkey and Russia rise. And uh, the relations between Turkey and the United States uh, is bitter in the last two years, especially in the, under the Obama administration. So uh, can you please compare uh, the two different periods, uh, the 15 years, the change in the policies in between these three countries? Thank you very much. And you know what, I'm going to take one more question, because I think this is going to be our last round, just based on the time, just right next to, uh, next to our previous question. Uh, hi, I am Dinah Pollockus. I am a Lithuanian American, a Harvard MBA consultant, moved to DC to get more involved in politics and development. And um, born in 1980, so we were very closely tracking what was going on with Russia. My question is about how to influence people outside the political realm in their own views of what's happening in Russia. So you, you might imagine, um, you might imagine I have some anti-Soviet sentiment, but I'm actually very curious and try to always understand other people's perspectives. And I found on Facebook and talking to friends, there is a very strong anti-Russia feeling, and I can, I ask questions, it's a very emotional reaction. So maybe my question is, are there media sources or places where we can get perspectives that aren't flavored by the US perspective? Tactical question. Alrighty. Um, so I think we'll go in the other, in the opposite direction this time. Um, on uh, on Mill Mill, um, 
So there isn't a specific mill mill section in uh, the in this report because there are mill mill bits and pieces throughout this report. I think of um, military engagement, like engagement and cooperation as a whole, as uh, not a good in and of itself, but as a means towards a variety of ends. So you're not going to get progress on your, your Atlantic security without military engagement. You're not going to get progress in the Middle East without military engagement. So I mean, I, I, I do think it's an important tool of this relationship um, because it enables conversations that keep people alive um, at, uh, at a minimum and lays the groundwork for more strategic conversations uh, as well. Uh, but it, it is threaded uh, through the report. Um, presidential commissions and other mechanisms. You know, I think I, I am generally all for things that build dialogue, and I, I, I find the presidential commissions have tended to be a symbolic mechanism to a large extent, right? They're set up to say, yes, we really are coming to the table, we really are talking. Right now, that's a pretty important signal to be sending. Um, I think the danger is then you expect too much of them. You expect them to deliver things that they're not able to deliver in and of themselves. So I'm not opposed, but I do think that remits uh, need to be carefully designed. Um, I'll take the question of information. I mean, I find in today's day and age, you can pretty much find any viewpoint you want if you look for it. Uh, I, would, I would actually argue that uh, if you, you know, if you want the truth, you kind of you have to make up your own mind about whom you trust and whom you don't trust and why. But uh, and you know, and that's uh, I certainly have my views on that, and I I don't think that uh, I don't have a postmodern view of it. I do think there is real truth and real untruth. Um, but I also do recognize that there are a variety of viewpoints out there, and they're easier to find than they've ever been before, whether you want Russian perspectives, Lithuanian perspectives, uh, US perspectives, of which there are myriad, right, on each uh, of each of those. Um, so I guess uh, we'll, we'll hear what each other, our other colleagues have to say, but I, I will say I'm a little surprised by the question. Um, I think there's just so much information out there to, for anybody who's, uh, who's interested in looking for it. And I'll leave Turkey to uh, the minister. I will also leave Turkey. I will just comment on the mill to mill, frankly, which is, uh, yeah, mill to mill is very important. I would just layer in the defense to defense, which is to say in both of our systems, we have civilians in charge of the military and as important operationally as the mill to mill channel is, and it is very important, also important as those ministerial level defense to defense conversations about the way we think about our force, our use of force, and the role of our militaries uh, inside our national security systems. <clears throat> uh, first of all, um, you cannot have uh, military military contacts without political contacts. Only military people, they have to realize what politicians decide. They cannot by themselves do that job. That's why it's necessary you go step by step. First of all, restore political dialogue. On the highest level, we have two presidents, they are supreme commanders in our countries, and after that, they have to give instructions what military people have to do. When uh, President Obama and President Medvedev had meeting in London, they decided to prepare a new START treaty, and, they and they, in nine months, military people uh, prepared. That's why the first uh, priority is to restore political dialogue and after that start to go with other departments and to see what we can do uh, <clears throat> about uh, commission uh, i think that the best uh, channel was gor chernamirdin commission but it was it was necessary at that moment when we didn't have real developed bilateral relations in new circumstances, we needed something to help business people, to help politicians, to help other people to take decisions. I personally uh, think that presidential commission was not very useful. Uh, we have to, this is something, in, um, you may create such a commissions, then you don't have developed relations. 
when you have developed relations between uh, uh, business people, between people, sign, uh, scientists, uh, cultural people, they don't need th that help. That's why I think that we need to, not to think about new commissions, but to think how to, to help them, how to create conditions for that people. They know their job and they know how to work, but to give them conditions, to open opportunities for them. This is the main goal of uh, politicians, and they will do their job. Now speaking about Turkey, I think that you cannot uh, compare that situation with uh, the, this situation. With Turkey, we uh, traditionally wanted to, and we want to have good relations. We were working on bilateral level in different structures in the, around Black Sea and the, in other. Turkey was a member of uh, NATO and still is member of NATO, I don't know what will be the decision of, of Turkey, but we are working as our neighbor because we have a lot of common interests in many regions. Black Sea, you have Caucasus, you have uh, Middle East, you have Central Asia, it means we have a lot of agenda. And uh, we are happy that economically our relations are starting to, to restore after crisis which we had. And this is nothing to do with relations between Turkey and the United States. We don't play with Turkey to create problems with the United States. You are allies, Turkey and the United States, on bilateral level inside of NATO, and you have to resolve your problems. We have our problems enough. That's why we will continue to develop relations with the Turkey, and we want to have good relations with the United States. And about information uh, about Russia. I remember uh, September 11th, before what happened. Uh, in our public opinion, polls were saying that in, in the majority had negative uh, attitude towards the United States. After September 11th, when we demonstrated our solidarity and we started to work together uh, in many places uh, in Afghanistan and starting to work together, to struggle together against uh, um, terrorism, the, the negative uh, reaction was go, going down. I don't remember 10 or 15 percent, but very low percent. That's why you cannot find information in, uh, in, uh, inside. So if we have political real dialogue, you will see immediately how the situation may change. Because today, when you don't receive something positive, or to say something positive is uh, not crime, but something uh, negatively uh, accepted in our countries, how, how you can create good information atmosphere? That's why I, I come back. Political dialogue, after that, very concrete decisions where we can work together, and there will be improvement, improvement in, in the atmosphere too. Well, about the objective information uh, about Russia, about the United States, my only advice would be to travel there and just spend time communicate with the people uh, to live in St. Petersburg, in, in Moscow, to visit distant places, Russian provinces, it's, uh, I think, the, the, best, uh, the best way to explore what's going on inside Russia. Now, for example, my wife and I, we were really blessed to uh, uh, have spent uh, almost nine years here in, the, in, in D.C., and we spent many of our vacations just traveling through the United States, through the national parks of the United States, uh, camping and hiking and uh, finding new friends, and uh, we visited uh, every state in the United States, it uh, uh, made a tremendous difference uh, in helping uh, for us personally to better understand the culture, the nature, the people uh, of America. And uh, I believe that's why I believe that uh, human contacts and uh, uh, interaction between between the societies, uh, seeing, uh, exploring culture of uh, our countries, is the best way to kind of create your own impression and so to see it with your own eyes. 
Well, since I'm the, the last one, uh, uh, let me just try to generalize a little bit. Uh, they say that uh, a true relationship starts not when two persons look at each other all the time, but uh, when they look at the world through the same lens. And I think uh, that tells you something about the limitations of the bilateral aspects of our relationship. Unfortunately, right now, uh, I think uh, we see each other more as a part of the problem, not as a part of the solution. In this city, I'm sure that you, if you had big scissors and you could uh, cut, carve Russia out of the world map, many people in this city would be happy. And the other way around, I think that many in Moscow perceive Washington DC to be the source of problems that Russia confronts. And I think that this is something that we have to overcome. Uh, we have to work not just on bilateral relations, but on problems which we both consider to be important and where we can make a contribution together with other countries. It is difficult, the starting point is low, but I think that we have to do that because uh, we have a bumpy road ahead of us. It's not only about Russian-American relations, it's about the world, it's about the system of international relations, it's about the system of global ecosystem, it's about many things. So I do hope that you know, our report uh, will be a small but not insignificant contribution to this dialogue, which of course has to include other organizations and uh, other scholars. Uh, and uh, if we don't do it, I don't know who is capable of doing that. Thank Nobody. you. Nobody. Yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that is that is an excellent uh, note to end on. So before we do close, I want um, I have a lot of thanks to give out. Um, I want to offer my thanks to the all star cast of authors and other participants in this project. If you look at the list of authors in that executive summary, I think both on the Russian and the U.S. side, um, I, I'm blown away by the. Um, by the level of people and the expertise that, uh, that came to the table um, for this project. And I'm looking forward to continuing to engage all of them. I am extremely grateful to the Russian International Affairs Council for being our partners uh, in this effort and pushing it forward. Particularly, I'm grateful to Minister Ivanov and also to my boss, Dr. Hamry, for giving us their support uh, for this effort. I'm grateful to the Carnegie Corporation of New York for providing the fiscal support that made it possible for us to do this. And I'm grateful to all of you for being here or for listening um, in the privacy of your home or office uh, to the live cast. Um, and uh, I look forward also to hearing what all of you think and uh, helping us chart this course better because I agree with my Russian colleagues uh, that we do have to move forward. Thank you so much.